Hello, this is uh, Christian Idealism, and today I have a very special guest on. His name is Joe Smith. Um, he has a pretty good YouTube channel. Um, he studies philosophy and religion as much as I do. We're both philosophy nerds, as you can probably tell. <laughs> um, but today we're having a little discussion about um, philosophy religion and why it's important. And I guess the sort of um, things you see, because I mean, when it comes to debates about God's existence, uh, there's a really, it's bad, like at least in pop culture, there's a lot of bad arguments on both sides. Um, we're not gonna really go into that, but we're gonna go into how philosophy of religion, um, approaching it from a more like academic perspective um, can really kind of help um, like, you know, come to a better understanding on both sides. Cause especially again, like I said before, debates about God's existence are pretty bad, <laughs> at least in the mainstream culture. But philosophy of religion to me seems like that's kind of the intellectual way to sort of uh, approach that sort of question. Does God exist, right? Or, you know, does, is naturalism true or stuff like that? Um, so I guess the first question we should kind of discuss here is the goal of the philosophy of religion, right? Um, now, I'm guessing the goal would probably be to reach truth. <laughs> um, what do you think, Joe? What's what's the goal of philosophy of religion? Yeah, so first, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it, and uh, I'm looking forward to this discussion. So um, yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, so I think first and foremost, we have to recognize that philosophy of religion is philosophy. And so, um, you know, kind of the getting getting a grasp on the goals of philosophy will presumably help us get a yeah. grasp on the goals of philosophy of religion. So philosophy as such really is kind of like a systematic and rigorous intellectual inquiry into the fundamental nature of reality, our cognitive or epistemic access to it, and sort of how we act within reality and, and so on. And it uses like the tools of reason, uh, you know, logic, critical thinking, argumentation, universal experience, and of other interdisciplinary findings um, really as a way to gain not only greater precision and clarity and understanding of issues, but also truth on those issues, like you said. So, right. um, so yeah, it's philosophy, but it's also philosophy of religion. And so it's really trying to take all those fundamental goals of philosophy, namely clarity, precision, greater understanding, and truth. I mean, I, those are kind of four of them, but it's trying to take those and apply them to uh, you know, debates concerning religion. And so what, what would that look like? It looked like something like um, the question of God. So that's going to include whether God exists. So like natural theology, natural atheology, um, and if God does exist, what is his nature like? Uh, so that's going to be looking at different models of God and divine attributes. And then thirdly, how God relates to the world, like, um, you know, whether or not his nature and existence are religiously significant, um, divine action in the world, and so on. So it looks at God, um, but it also looks at religious belief. And so that's going to be, you're thinking of like the epistemic side as to whether or not religious belief can, can or is uh, can be or is rational. Um, you're looking at like evidentialism and, and proper functionalism and all these sorts of things, um, as well as the evidential value of things like religious experience. And so it kind of brings in epistemology into that domain as well. So you got God, religious belief. You've also got religion itself. So, um, you know, you're asking the question, well, what is religion? Um, and then finally, as a kind of fourth uh, element of philosophy of religion, you probably got uh, claims pertaining to religiously significant aspects of reality, like afterlife, heaven, hell, uh, free will, and, and other sorts of uh, meaning in life, things like that, other sorts of things like that. So that's kind of the, I would say, is the, the goal of philosophy, philosophy of religion, and uh, the various aspects of philosophy of religion. Yeah, um, I couldn't really agree more <laughs> on that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess it's, because I guess, I guess we can kind of talk about the sort of objections you hear at least from atheists, but um, but yeah, I guess you could say that it's it's sort of taking philosophy, like the objective examination, trying to understand what reality is, um, how we understand reality, how we come to know it, try to apply that to God, or at least apply it to religious belief in general, right? Um, and then of course, you know, you can question, okay, does God exist? If he does exist, what are what's his nature, right? And there's a lot of different models. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna go over the models here, but I'm sure you're aware of pantheism, panantheism, you know, those sorts of models and whether or not those have any significance on um, religious experience or, you know, religious justification, whether or not you're justified in believing in one religion over others. So, yeah, um, I guess the goal, I guess you can say, 
is to try to examine um, that sort of thing, right? Absolutely. Um, and it's interesting because um, I guess this goes into our next point, which is about what, what theists and atheists can get from it, right? Because if the goal is to try to reach truth, well, then what, like, how, so how can the theist use it? Um, I guess the question we can ask is, how is the theist going to use it to reach truth? And then how is the atheist going to use it to reach truth? Now, of course, atheists don't believe in God, right? But on, from their perspective, at least, they would at least have to hold, or not have to, but most of them would hold to some naturalism, right? Um, now, that's a whole different um, position, of course. It's it's that no God exists and that there's just nature, right? So that's what naturalism is. Um, but I, even then, it's like, okay, from philosophy of religion, what can we kind of learn, right, from both sides? So whether you're, whether you do believe in God or whether you don't believe in God, um, what's the sort of thing we can learn? And I mean, from my own perspective, I mean, I don't know about you, but as a theist, I mean, I've changed my mind plenty of times, right? So I used to be a neoclassical theist. I mean, I would still con consider myself a neoclassical theist, but I'm more of a panentheist, right? Because I don't, <laughs> I don't actually accept like William and Craig's version of God. Um, but, but of course, that's because of my metaphysical views, anyways. But still, I mean, the you know, ever since I've been kind of studying this sort of subject, I've figured out like, hey, there's a lot of similarities with my view with uh, some sort of naturalism, right? So if you take, for example, um, Philip Leone's The Principle of Material Causality, I could actually accept that principle because I'm a panentheist, right? Or existential inertia. So, you know, there's a lot of similarities I see between um, theism and naturalism, right? And I've actually gotten more clarity, gotten more understanding, um, at least from my own perspective, on what the nature of reality is, right? Because um, I used to hold to some, you know, guy daddy type of idea <laughs> where now my view of God is much more flexible. It's much more interesting, I think. Um, and it's much more, it helps me understand reality better. Right. Um, now from, I mean, I know you're not a theist, but I guess from your kind of perspective, I know you're agnostic. So now you wouldn't, you wouldn't actually be a naturalist in the strict sense, but um, what's sort of your thing that you've learned kind of interacting with the theistic side? Yeah, well, I think um, you were actually kind of pointing to the main thing that I was going to say sort of uh, yeah. in response to that question, which is bridging ideological barriers and, and sort of uh, recognizing the best in each kind of worldview and trying to get a kind of synthesis between them. And you were just you're just pinpointing that how, right. you know, as as Josh and Felipe in their in their dialogue and in their, in their recent book that they um, published, like, is God the best explanation of things or something? Um, they were at, at the very end, they came to views that were very similar to one another. Uh, they had a kind of uh, a foundational reality. It's necessary in some sense. Um, it has proto qualitative and phenomenal uh, and intentional properties and so on. And so really interesting how you can uh, take the best of naturalism, arguably the best of theism, arguably, and you get a kind of synthesis or a kind of union between the two. So that, that's, that's interesting that um, you mentioned that and I was actually gonna uh, piggyback off of that. So. Um, yeah, that's, that's my main response. Yeah. I mean, I've, I mean, of course I know most theists aren't really philosophically minded, but for those that are, I've kind of noticed this trend where the theist is going more towards the monistic side. And then the naturalist is going more towards this idea that consciousness is primary, or at least that it can't be reduced. Right. So you have one extreme which has this sort of natural, supernatural distinction, right? And that's the theistic side, right? Um, and then you have a naturalist, hardcore naturalist side where you're, you're a straight up physicalist where you say that consciousness is just like some epiphenomena or, you know, some, you know, or it's reducible to, you know, something else. But it's interesting how when you get closer, when you kind of put those two together, you actually get a view where there, like, there is no natural and supernatural distinction where we can actually be monists, right? So both, both sides could be monists, but they can also accept this sort of like fundamental mentality, right? And that's where you get views like panpsychism, cosmopsychism. And yeah, I mean, it's a form of naturalism, but it's closer to theism. And in the same way, you know, panentheism is actually closer to naturalism than other forms of theism, right? Because 
like I don't have to accept that sort of distinction between natural and supernatural. Um, and I actually, it's funny because I read this like a few months ago and um, <laughs> I was like, well, I don't agree with the, you know, natural supernatural distinction anyways. So I don't know if Oppie's sort of criticism would um, apply at least to my sort of theism. So uh, again, I mean, uh, I think it's very interesting how at least the public's among the public sphere, people that don't study this stuff, they will typically, they have like this sort of dichotomy, right? So it's really hard to sort of get over those barriers. Whereas if you actually do study this stuff, right? If you actually, you know, go into philosophy of religion and sort of understand where each side is coming from, then, then yeah, you get this sort of synthesis and you get a greater understanding of where each side is coming from. Um, now, whether or not it's going to actually happen, whether or not maybe one day we'll all agree to some view, but I mean, it's it's at least hopeful. Like it's it's at least possible in principle that we could come to some sort of shared understanding, right? Um, and I and I find that to be so. I guess that would answer the question: What can theists and atheists get from this? It's that well, we can both come to a better understanding, right? Um, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I'm pretty sure you probably agree with that anyways. Yeah, better understanding of the, the fundamental nature of reality, bridging ideological barriers as we were trying to um, articulate there. And probably also as well, I mean, um, you know, on the line, a lot of things are on the line. I mean, potentially a relationship with God is on the line, right? Um, if, if God's nature is such that he can be in a relationship and um, if God does in fact exist, you know, that's on the line with respect to philosophy of religion. Um, moreover, what's also on the line? A potential for salvation, um, eternal bliss and happiness and fulfillment. There's also, uh, contrary wise, a potential for eternal conscious torment and torture and destruction. <laughs> yeah. um, and as well, uh, uh, you know, a potential at least for sheer and utter annihilation at our deaths. So, so much is on the line. The meaning of life is on the line, things like that. Um, really, also what's on the line is like the fundamental and ultimate source of things. You know, like in ancient philosophers were pretty adamant that to understand something, you need to understand its cause or its source or some kind of, some kind of thing which accounts for it. Uh, it's idea, really, it's, it's explanation. And so that's really what philosophy of religion is in large part after. It's after the ultimate reality. It's after, you know, what is this ultimate reality? Is it personal? Is it impersonal? Is it conscious? Is it not? Um, and finally, uh, I think what the atheist is probably going to be thinking that we can get the most out of this is that, you know, it's a means, it's an avenue by which we can shield and protect ourselves from potentially harmful and false beliefs. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of atheists are adamant that, for instance, uh, a belief in hell might be potentially harmful. I'm not taking a side on that right here. I, I'm yeah. just saying that Th th these are this is what's on the line a lot of things are on the line and for atheists i mean it it's a manner of perhaps uh shielding ourselves from beliefs that you know even though we might want them to be true we need to have the courage to face reality you need to radically surrender to reality and that's really what philosophy of religion helps us to do i think right from both sides i mean because i mean i used to deny evolution right <laughs> i mean we all have, we've, uh, what I'm basically trying to say is we all have had false beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. um, on both sides, right? Um, I, think, I think that's kind of interesting how, um, like, I guess when you, when you really think deep about this stuff, then, um, then you have less false beliefs. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, you're now correct. I mean, right now I could be wrong about mm -hmm. what I believe, right? But at least I have, I guess I'm closer to truth, right, yeah. than I was before. And I think that's kind of the goal, right? Is to get as close to uh, basically truth as we can, right? Um, now, another thing, I guess this is going, this goes on to our third point, which is um, how this is different than apologetics. Now, I know you're not apologist, but f speaking from my own perspective, what you typically see among the apologetics community is um, you basically have like this sort of, I wouldn't say bias, but they're trying to like defend this position, which is, you know, Christianity, of course, but they're not really intellectually, I guess, uh, I wouldn't say intellectually, but they're, um, they're not really doing philosophy like they should be. Right. Um, and I think that's, that's the sort of distinction you have to make between the apologetics, um, realm, which basically just tries to make arguments for God and tries to address arguments against God. Right. Or, 
um, or that you know you have the philosophy of religion type, which critically more critically examines it and sees okay which which ones are more probable than others, right? Because um, I mean I don't know about you, but I mean speaking from my own experience, a lot of the arguments that I see in the apologetics community are actually not that good. <laughs> um, and I'm not saying that to be kind of um, mean, but I'm just trying to like, you know, get people to understand like, hey, like we need to make progress, right? And I think that's the whole goal, right? Because if you keep on using the same arguments over and over and over again, you're not gonna, you're not gonna really convince anyone, right? Uh, if you look at Craig's Kalam, like that's used over and over and over again. If you lose, you know, the moral arguments or stuff like that, it's just the same stuff over and over and over again. So, I mean, speaking from my, my own perspective, this is why I find philosophy religion better in a way is because it helps you kind of make progress, right? To have a better understanding. Whereas I don't know, I'm not sure if apologetics can have progress. I mean, I know, I know you're not a Christian and I also know you're not an atheist. I know you're agnostic, but what do you think? Because I, at least I feel like um, within the apologetics community, there's not much progress made in terms of like intellectually looking at this stuff. What do you think? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. And it's difficult because, um, right, like I do want to emphasize that, uh, you know, what, what we're both about to talk about and what we've been talking about, of course, is not going to apply to all apologists and all apologetics. You're and right, yeah. <laughs> but I just, I just wanted to yeah. get the audience to just to recognize that, um, you know, we don't want to be making such sweeping state i'm not saying that you were I, i'm just saying for okay. the audience yeah. like uh even for the audience and for us we don't we want to avoid making sweeping statements about whole swaths of people in in whole communities but um now uh, let's see apologetics so apologist comes from greek right that's apologia which means defense or to give a defense um and so really in some sense we're all apologists um for, that is true for, yeah for particular positions right because right we each defend um, particular positions and as do atheists and agnostics. So what that really makes me think is that um, at least the difference that you're pinpointing with respect to at least some trends, which we might view as potentially problematic, at least some trends in um, uh, apologist communities online, on YouTube and so on, I think that the principal difference there and uh, what's potentially bad that you're pinpointing is a kind of epistemic attitude um, that, that that's, embodied and uh, conveyed within apologetics communities versus philosophy religion communities. So there is, yeah, I do, that's right. I do see a sort of distinction, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, it's it's somewhat difficult to sort of pinpoint what exactly it is, but I don't know, yeah, what do you it, think? It, no, that, that's good. And so I, I do think it, it kind of, one, at least one of the essential ingredients here is epistemic attitude. And, and so when I, or at least when outsiders look at the some of the trends among some in the apologetics community, um, they think they get the distinctive impression that a lot of it seems to just be about convincing and defending. So convincing others and defending, uh, defending their positions. Whereas in the philosophy of religion side, it seems from people on the, um, for, for the, from these people who are on the outside of the apologetics perspective, yeah. it seems to them that it's more of a kind of explorative enterprise. It's more so, um, I don't know, it's like probing, investigating, exploring, inquiry, um, where it's not as much trying to convince others and get them on your side and to defend uh, worldviews. It's, it's less defense. It's more so invitation of, of critical scrutiny and so on, like you were saying, talking about um, the kind of critical appraisal. And so once again, I don't want to give the impression that this is true of apologetics as such, or that it's true of people in the apologetic community. I'm simply pinpointing some particular trends among some people that the outsiders might have concerns with, with, with respect to the um, uh, apologetic community. Yeah. Yeah. Cause um, I, I mean, I should say, okay. I, I should yeah, also yeah. say that like these problems um, afflict everyone. And they afflict philosophers of religion too, right? Philosophers of religion too get tribalistic. They also can get in the mindset of trying to defend things and trying to convince others. I get into that mindset as well. And really it goes down to the fundamental human biases and, and instincts that we have that psychologists and cognitive scientists have uncovered. So it, it's not as though this is distinctive or unique to the apologetics community. And really I think what this, what this tells us is that everyone needs to work on uh, epistemic virtues and trying to right. think critically and, and you know, acquire and cultivate the dispositions 
of you know critical and reflective thought, of philosophical reasoning, of open-mindedness, and so on. So, yeah, yeah, it, and I, you know, it's not easy to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it is very difficult to try and get over those sort of biases that you see. Yeah. Right? I mean, I'm biased about my own positions, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you're biased, and everybody's some sort of you know biased. Um, and I, I mean, that's just human nature, right? Like anytime you make an argument or something, right? You're always gonna be biased towards one view over another, right? Um, and I don't know, well, yeah. So <laughs> I guess that's pretty much it with regards to that. But I guess the main goal, I guess, is to try to kind of make progress, right? Um, because, you know, it's one thing to see an argument being put forth or something like that, but it's another thing to see that over and over and over again. And I think I don't know, but from my own from my own perspective, to me that's not really gonna help, mm -hmm. right? Because especially the Kalama, I don't know. I mean, at least I'm just speaking from the from my own perspective. The Kalama argument is probably one of the most widely known arguments, both in philosophy, religion, and um, at least Christian apologetics, right? Mm -hmm. um, like every pretty much everybody knows about it. Um, of course, not. I'm not saying like the general public knows about it, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, it's a pretty popular argument. Um, but I mean, I don't know if you notice this, but there's not a lot of uh, defenses given um, within the apologetics community. But if you look into the academic literature, so if you look into like the philosophy of religion literature, there actually are new things being talked about mm -hmm. with regards to that sort of argument, right? Um, like, for example, I only, f I just figured out about the Grim Reaper paradox about two years ago. Like, I didn't know about it before, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's just something, I know that's just one example, but, um, but yeah, I think it's important to kind of make progress, right? And if we're trying to investigate reality. So that's why for me personally, I like, I actually, I, I, I don't know about you, but I actually like the label Christian philosopher rather than Christian apologist, but mm -hmm. that's just, yeah. That's just me. Okay, so we're at 22 minutes. Okay, so now we're gonna get into answering objections. Um, so I just wanna ask, before I kind of give my sort of objections that I've that I've heard, what are the objections that you've heard to the field? Yeah, so I, I, I basically had, I listed two, two main objections that I've, I've seen people level towards me um, when I talk about philosophy of religion and so on to the entire field. So. The, the first one is that, like, listen, this stuff, the domain of inquiry here, the, the pur purported objects of study are, in principle, unknowable, right? So you're talking about these ultimate realities, you're talking about God, you're talking about the afterlife, and so on. These things are so far beyond our experience that that is, in principle, unknowable. Like, like you yeah. guys are just, you know, you're just puffing air or something. So that's essentially, that's one objection. Um, that like, listen, you guys are trying to study the unstudyable. Uh, I know I made up that word, but who cares? Yeah. Um, so, and then the second objection that I've heard is that, um, well, listen, science can, can give us all these answers. Like we don't need to, we don't need to appeal to philosophy of religion. Instead, we have science and the tools of the scientific method to investigate fundamental and ultimate reality. So those are the two main objections that, that I've heard, but I'm interested to hear some of yours. Yeah. So, um, this isn't my objection, but I've heard it. Um, and he made this guy, his name's Tom Jump. Um, I'm sure you've heard of him, but his objection is basically that um, philosophy religion is like pseudoscience. Um, that because like philosophy, like no one cares about philosophy. We, don't, we only, again, it's, it's sort of the uh, scientism sort of thing. So, oh, well, we can't understand the fundamental nature of reality. Um, it's a pseudoscience, you know, cause he'll, I don't want to call him out, but he'll use arguments from authority and then when you point out that most philosophers of religion are theists, you'll be like, oh, well, that, that whole field is pseudoscience, right? He'll, he'll sort of compare it to uh, homeopathy or some other, uh, <laughs> like, other fringe field, right? Um, or mythology, right? So he'll compare it to that. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Because, um, I don't know, it, it seems childish to me. Yeah, so um, I'm not familiar. Well, I like I know who Tom Jump is, but I'm not familiar with uh, his work in, um, you know, like in online and in these debates. So I can't really yeah. arbitrate on, uh, you know, what his position is. But uh, given this description here, I mean, I agree, it, it does not sound it doesn't sound correct, um, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Uh, I mean, 
for one thing, homeopathy, I mean, like these, these guys are, homeopathy is trying to make certain empirical claims. Um, they're, they're trying to make kind of like uh, claims about uh, what can heal you and the properties of water and whether diluting it by like powers of 10 can somehow, um, you know, make it more potent or, uh, you know, how water has certain like memory, uh, uh, yeah. memory traces. Like, I don't know all the specifics <laughs> about homeopathy, but I've studied, yeah. <laughs> I've studied it enough to know that they're making certain empirical claims uh, that uh, can be and have been tested and falsified by the scientific method. And so that's relevantly disanalogous. And, and that's why it's, it's pseudoscience. And it also uses um, uh, non-truth oriented paths to, to knowledge, like, you know, like yeah. uh, anecdotal evidence for uh, homeopathy working and things like that. But that's crucially different from philosophy of religion, right? Uh, philosophy of religion is not making uh, these kind of empirical claims that are amenable to scientific verification and testing, right? We're talking about uh, like a reality which, if it existed, would be the foundation of the existence of any scientific method at all in the first place that, that would account for um, uh, less fundamental things that would explain them. And so like, it's just, it's a category error to try to compare this with pseudoscience because it's just not trying to give a kind of empirical account of reality. It's a metaphysical account of reality, um, which is also precisely what Tom Jump is engaging in when he's saying that like this isn't, um, you know, like you can't use philosophy of religion because he has these other metaphysical commitments that, that rule that out. And so he is Im thereby implicating himself in metaphysics when he's making these claims about um, philosophy of religions not being able to latch on to truth and so on. So, yeah. Yeah, because um, it's funny how you hear it mostly from atheists, right? Um, I don't know if that's just because they have a different sort of view, at least the general public. Now, of course, not, that's not to say that um, all the atheists are like this. It's just a select few. But, um, yeah, so you have this sort of, like, scientism going on yeah. where basically they're like, oh, well, we don't need philosophy religion because we can understand all of reality by science, right? Um, I'm just not sure if that works because you can't use science to prove science. Yeah. Right? So, so that's yeah. one of the, that's definitely one of the fundamental problems. I mean, uh, one of, one of the problems with that is that that very claim, right? That very claim that that science alone is what exhausts our knowledge of reality is the sole path to knowledge. In and of itself, that cannot be shown by science, right? There, there's no there's no pressure gauge measurements. There's no temperature measurements. None of those could could show you that that that's the case. And hence, you're using a non scientific means to arrive at that conclusion to try to argue that non-scientific means of arriving at conclusions are not truth oriented or don't confer knowledge. So it's, it's self, it's self undermining in that sense. But also, as you were pointing out, there's also this kind of circularity worry, right? Like science itself cannot be used to justify or account for the reliability or knowledge conferring status of science. That's circular. You're presupposing the very thing in need of justification as to why it's reliable or why it's a reliable guide to reality. In which case you have to adduce something beyond science to, um, to justify science's ability to track truth and its, its reliability and so on. And of course that's gonna be had in terms of metaphysics and philosophy of science and so on. Um, and finally, there are a whole host of presuppositions that are foundational to science that science alone cannot demonstrate, you know, like things like there is an external world or um, my perceptual faculties are reliable or my memory is reliable, right? Like none of these things can be demonstrated by science because any scientific experiment is there is going to have to presuppose them, right? Like when you're recording the data, right. you're presupposing that you're, you're reliably remembering what you saw when you looked at the, the Geiger counter or whatever. Um, yeah. and, and you're, you're presupposing that you are reliably latching on to what the Geiger counter is actually telling you. Um, so there are so many different problems with this kind of uh, scientific approach to reality that uh, I, I just don't think that this objection to philosophy of religion has any force. Right. Okay. Um, well, I guess we got through that sort of thing. Cause I, I can't think of any, I guess, better objections. Cause um, again, if we kind of, I guess, I guess the main point would be that we want people to understand what philosophy of religion does because I, at least, I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of atheists kind of equate it with apologetics, right? Mm. Um, and I don't think it is, right? I don't think philosophy of religion is not that sort of thing. Philosophy of religion is more about investigating kind of the, the nature of reality, right? And it's kind of funny because, I mean, philosophy of religion does kind of 
kind of mix in with other fields. So it mixes in with uh, epistemology. It mixes in with philosophy of science. It mixes in with metaphysics. Like there's a lot of stuff you have to understand. Like, you know, Graham Oppie's views about modality, like yeah, he would have to under, like in order to like understand, I guess, I guess for him to come to that view, he has to understand a lot of different, um, you know, fields in order to kind of hold that sort of position. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's kind of interesting how, um, I guess, I guess once we kind of investigate and try to understand what philosophy religion is, then, um, then we can come to have the better understanding and then, you know, then we can point out, okay, well, science is not the only means by which we know things because yeah, yeah. yeah you're making a sort of category error in regards to that. And also, um, I, I did want to, you know, that, that first objection that I kind of articulated, um, yeah. which is like, listen, these things, this is like ultimate reality. These are in principle unknowable and so on. Um, by my lights, I don't think that that objection works either, right? Because um, like the person who's making that objection is already in doing so, presupposing that we have some grasp of what these things are or what they would be like, so as to say that we don't have any grasp of them. So it's another kind of uh, self-undermining position. In order to say that these things are in principle unknowable or that we don't have any cognitive or epistemic access to, to this whole domain of reality and so on, you would thereby have to already be kind of examining, well, if these things existed, what would they be like? Would we be able to have cognitive access to them? And so on. Like, you're already engaging in this kind of, um, this kind, very kind of deliberation that they're denying is reliable. Uh, and they're denying that we have epistemic access to. Uh, in short, you'd already kind of have to have the epistemic access there in order to try to say that there would be no epistemic access to this kind of domain. And so, um, right. uh, I, I just, Again, I, I don't think that that objection to philosophy of religion succeeds. So I, I did just want to get that that response yeah. out. Okay. All right. Um, so if, I'm gonna get. Some, I'm gonna try to get some questions from the audience, real quick, and then we'll close off. Um, I know this is kind of early, but that's fine. Um, we didn't have to go the full forty minutes. So um, guys, if you want to ask questions, do it now, because um, we we're gonna end this in around ten minutes from now. So uh, go ahead and ask as many questions as you can. We'll try to get as much as we can, and and then we'll close off. Um, all right. Ooh, okay. From our link's most recent reply to me, he wants to say that metaphysics is just intuition, therefore invalid. He also wants to doubt L and C because of O. I think, okay, so Joe, I don't know if you've been watching my um, YouTube videos, but there's this guy named underlinks on YouTube that I've been interacting with and he responded to the principle of cause and effect or, you know, the whole idea that every, everything that begins to exist has a cause. So he says that that's just an appeal to intuition. Like that's not actually true. <laughs> um, <laughs> in any sort of way, what do you, what do you think about that? Hmm. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> okay. So, um, there's a lot to say there. Uh, let's just see. So first of all, you don't need to justify that particular claim solely by means of intuition. You have lots of other methods. Um, so one of them you could just like, you know, we just have universal inductive experiential support of that premise, right? So one of them is a kind of universal inductive support. Uh, another one, so it's just like gravity, really. Um, yeah. Another one would be something like, uh, you know, it's, it's an inference to the best explanation why, whenever we see things coming into existence, why? Why do we always also thereby see them having a cause? Well, maybe here's a hypothesis that predicts and explains that data. Things simply can't come into being from nothing. They can't come into existence uncaused. It's, an, it's a kind of explanatory hypothesis that accounts for the data, which is something that happens in science. I mean, that's just, you're just using scientific yeah. methodology there as applied to philosophy. And so you don't need to rely on intuition, but suppose you did need to rely on intuition. <laughs> that's fine. I mean, we. Intuition yeah. is, is perfectly um, perfectly reliable, a perfectly respectable means of coming to knowledge. Why is that? Well, just just consider it. I mean, consider in your mind, um, like, how do you know? Like, how do you know that nothing can be both red all over and green all over at the same time and in the same respect? Like, how do you know that? Well, I mean, you've never seen anything like that. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you, yeah, you, right. you've never come across it. Um, it's not as though you're like, oh, well, this thing isn't red all over and green all over. This thing isn't red all over and green all over. This thing isn't red all over. And you know, that's not how you do it. You can yeah. just see, I, like you could just tell 
you could just see, like, <laughs> use your mind, use your intuition. You can automatically tell just by your rational intuition that that cannot be the case. Nothing can be both red and green all over at the same respect at the same time. And so intuition, I, I think, is a perfectly respectable way to go about arguing for things. Um, yeah, so th that's my main response. Yeah, because, I mean, for me, I I actually, so it's funny because uh, Josh Rasmussen, he, he kind of responds to the same sort of objection in his book um, that he makes this sort of distinction between dependent and demanded. So, like, you don't have to accept that all effects are demanded, right? You can just say that they're all dependent and so uh, that that was my response to him because I did I did a video response to him on my channel, but um, but yeah, that's kind of what I was kind of getting across. But um, but yeah, all right. So next question is, what? <laughs> okay, this this is interesting. Okay, can you ask Joe what arguments are strong enough to convert? I guess he's talking about you. Yeah. Um, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a good question. I mean, really, if you go to my, my video on, on my channel, Majesty of Reason, if you go to my video, uh, Why Am I Agnostic? I articulate different things that pull me towards theism and different things that pull me towards atheism. Um, and so I guess, you know, like what arguments are, are or would be strong enough? I mean, we would either have to increase the uh, the number of arguments that I find persuasive on one side or the other. So we'd have to like increase this one while keeping this one constant or yeah. also Alternatively, we could take away some arguments that I, I used to think were plausible on this side, but I no longer think are plausible, thereby, you know, keeping this one the same, but lowering this one. So that's a second path. And then a third path would be just to take the arguments that I do think support either side, um, but to increase their kind of force to my mind, like, I, you know, the plausibility, the strength of those particular reasons. And so although it'd be the exact same reasons, they would be stronger. Uh, so those three means, I think, are the, the ways that it, it would kind of take me to, to shift closer to one side or the other. Yeah. And I can tell you're probably more, um, you're probably closer to classical, no, neoclassical theism than classical theism. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah so. Most people should, should be able to tell that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you, you make a lot of interesting videos against classical theism. So, uh, so yeah. All right. Um, what view of metaethics does Joe take? I, yeah, you can answer that one. I don't know. Yeah, so, well, that's a good question. Um, in metaethics, broadly, I'm a moral realist. Um, I think that our, just the intuitive self-evidence of something like, you know, torturing babies for fun is morally impermissible. Um, that intuitive uh, self-evident truth, I think, that's going to take a lot of, of def it's going to take a lot of defeating strength, a lot of defeating force in order to overturn that self-evidence. And so uh, I think that the burden of a burden of proof in debates between moral realists and non-realists is on the non-realists. They really have to go against, <laughs> against like, yeah. almost evident intuitions, like the Holocaust was wrong, like the Holocaust shouldn't have happened. Like, I yeah. mean, it's pretty hard to, to justify thinking that the Holocaust was didn't have any properties of wrongness to it or things like that. So yeah, I, I, I lean towards moral realism. Now, the question of what kind of moral realism, you know, like there, there's uh, non-natural moral realism. So that's kind of like a, a, a moral Platonism of sorts. Uh, there, there's natural moral realism or um, ethical naturalism, which takes uh, moral properties to be um, natural pro some kinds of natural properties maybe it's like neurophysiological pain states or, or other kinds of things uh right. or maybe it's state flourishing of of creatures you know i'm 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 kind of open on those issues i don't know like I, I work in metaphysics and philosophy of religion so i need to do more research yeah, on, right. on that. Um, and so and then what books would he suggest um uh well i when people ask me for books and things on such a large topic it's difficult so what i suggest is go to the stanford encyclopedia of philosophy and the internet encyclopedia of philosophy read them, and then uh, also look at the bottom where they have the references. Those are always amazing, and they get you into they get you into the debate really, really well. So that's my suggestion. All right, we're starting to run low on time, so these questions right now are going to be the last. So we have three more to go, and then we'll close Sounds it off. Good. Sounds good. All right, so the next one is, would you agree with Dr. Graham Oppie that the fine-tuning argument is not six? Well, it depends. Okay, so I guess I'll answer first. So I would say certain certain versions of fine tuning, I don't think work. Like, I don't think deductive ones work, but I think the, the like um, Swinburne's inductive arguments, I think they do work. 
Um, and I do think that I think I think uh, the universe is fine tuned. In fact, I think it's very, um, especially life. I think life is also also fine tuned as well. Um, so I would probably say that um, it is evidence for God, but again, we have to look at it, the cumulative case. So it's only like one thing, one aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what's yeah. your answer, Joe? So, I mean, with respect to this particular question, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to answer it just because I'm, I'm not like a, a physicist. I don't know the, the details of, of the, the physics here. So I, I can't say whether or not Graham Oppy is correct there. Um, but uh, what I can say is that, um, well, I can make a recommendation to viewers if you guys want to look at perhaps one, one line of criticism of the kind of physics-based fine-tuning arguments, you can look at um, the paper, it's called Naturalism, Fine-Tuning, and Flies by Aaron Lucas. Um, and so, so you can look there. Uh, I myself, uh, it's kind of funny that you were saying it, like um, you're talking about Swinburne's kind of approach. Yeah. I actually like more a priori philosophical based fine tuning arguments from order of reality, from, you know, like the, right. the order, the, the elegance, the mathematical uh, and rational intelligibility of the world. Um, at least a priori, that's more expected under theism than on naturalism. Um, and so it would at least provide some kind of Bayesian support. Right, yeah. for it's probably, again, I, I wouldn't say it's like it shouldn't. Can, I mean, it's, it's not, not impossible. Yeah. yeah, like it's not impossible under naturalism. Um, yeah, but right. what we're saying is not like epistemic expectability. So, right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I that's would... my sorry. I can only confess what what seems to me to be the case. Right. So yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess our answers seem very really similar. So, anyways, um, the next one is science recognizes the transcendent realm as reality. Why then do online key <laughs> yeah i don't know <laughs> um yeah um uh, but I, I mean I, I well it depends on what he means by transcendent realm yeah, yeah. right like i mean like science well okay i just have to ask him what he means by the transcendent realm because yeah. science when i think of transcendent realm i think of like like non spatiotemporal kind of like the platonic abstracta or maybe if there's some kind of like spaceless timeless uh Brahmin or maybe classical theistic God. That's what I think of. In which case, science is not going to be able to recognize that that reality because science is inherently limited to kind right. of the, the spatial temporal world of things bashing into one another. So um, I, I'd have to ask him what he means. But uh, as to online keyboard warriors, I just say tis the nature of on people online. Uh, it's just <laughs> All right. There's actually one really good question. We'll go. We'll do this like within 30 seconds. So books to read as introduction. Ah, yes. Uh, I've got three or four maybe that I can recognize. So um, one of them is William Rose, uh, William Rowe, R-O-W-E, his introduction to philosophy of religion. It's just called that. Second one is Brian, well, okay, it's pronounced Brian Davis, but it's spelled Brian Davies. Um, his introduction to philosophy of religion, I think it's also just called introduction to philosophy of religion. And then thirdly, William Wainwright's, his uh, introduction to philosophy of religion, um, so those three, and then, uh, yeah, I, that, that's mine. Okay. So this is, I saved the last, the last question is actually probably my favorite one, because I think this kind of helps um, get to a better understanding on both sides, which is, um, how can we convince YouTube atheism that philosophy of religion is a serious topic? Um, well, I don't know about you, Joe, but for me, I'm going to be presenting at least the theistic side of the case for God. And then, you know, the atheists... Um, like Mitch and you and Mitch could probably present the uh, the atheist side if you guys want. No, again, I'm not. I know you're not an atheist, but <laughs> yeah. So I would say if you want to, um, you know, have YouTube atheists kind of use philosophy religion, then I would say to bolster, try to bolster the theistic side, but also try to bolster the atheist side. So basically, um, when you got you know when there's some sort of internet dialogue going on then you can kind of apply the same standards as philosophers would, right? Um, one good um, basic channel I'd recommend is Elephant Philosophy. Um, he has a lot of good content <laughs> on there. Um, and then a good atheist one would probably be Mitch's channel, though he hasn't done any formal videos yet, but I'm sure he will. So, um, so yeah, what do you think, Joe? Um, yeah, I guess my main answer is just elevate the discourse on all sides. Um, so just work on... Cultivating, of course, the intellectual virtues of, uh, you know, 
open-mindedness and uh, willingness to seek the truth and things like that, but also, you know, to to really, uh, I guess, popularize aspects of philosophy of religion. So that that's what I'm. That's what you're doing on your channel with having Josh Rasmussen yep. on. That's what I'm doing on my channel, right? Uh, kind of popularizing the the more robust, philosophically speaking, uh, aspects of philosophy of religion, and uh, people will just. When they watch it, they'll see that this is something worth taking seriously because it's got sort of a rational, argumentative foundation to it. So I just say elevate the discourse, really. Yep. All right. Well, we reached the time. Concluding thoughts. Uh, so, so yeah, I guess the the importance of philosophy, religion, is just the importance of any philosophy, right? Trying to reach truth, trying to understand the nature of reality. Um, that's what I say. Uh, what about you, Joe? Same thing? Or? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I said clarity, greater clarity, precision, uh, understanding, and truth concerning the, the fundamental ultimate reality. And and who doesn't want that? I mean. <laughs> yep. All right, Joe. Well, uh, thanks for coming on. Um, thank you guys for watching. Um, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments. I'll try to, or maybe, Joe, you can kind of check back if you have any questions or you know, you know, if people ask you questions or whatever, but go check out his channel. It's a majesty of reason. He has a lot of good content. And, um, so yeah, um, I hope that you do well, Joe. <laughs> and let's hope that this, this, uh, well, let's hope that this next election isn't too chaotic, but we'll see. <laughs> oh man. We're past that point. I think. Yeah. All right. See you guys later.